I helped produce a virtual shadowing video series that is now also a podcast with a fourth year medical student named Dan. So as a bonus episode, I'm posting part of an episode from this podcast series. I'm posting the part of this podcast, which is the patient cases, which I think is the most interesting. This is a look into interventional radiology with Dr. Sahil Mehta. Going into this, I had no idea what interventional radiology was. But it's a really interesting specialty, and Dr. Meta goes through a few interesting cases, as well as some interesting procedures that he does on a pretty regular basis. So I hope you find this interesting, and enjoy. Last thing here, if you're interested in watching these videos, go to shadowing.medschoolcoach.com. Virtual Shadowing by Med School Coach brings you up close and personal with physicians from many different specialties. Walk through tough cases with each doctor and learn about their triumphs and the challenges that they face on a day-to-day basis. To view the video that this audio is from and to take the quiz that is associated with each podcast, visit shadowing.medschoolcoach.com. I think this is the best way to describe (laughs) interventional radiology, right? Uh, It's like surgery, only magic. You know, it it really is. Like the things that we're able to do are very much... um, like surgeries, right? They're minimally invasive surgeries. In fact, there's an entire group of interventional radiology that probably calls ourselves more minimally invasive surgeons than radiologists. Now, radiology, it, interventional radiology is typically considered a subspecialty of diagnostic radiology. Although a couple of years ago, actually interventional radiology started having its own residency. So now if you're a med student, you can actually go right into interventional radiology. Um, it's still certified by the same board, but basically it's something where we as interventional radiologists do not necessarily do the same. We, we don't actually do anything like a diagnostic radiologist does on maybe an everyday basis. So it's, it's kind of a different field. And I would consider it more of a surgical subspecialty than a subspecialty of diagnostic radiology. At least that's the way I, I sort of look at it. Um, and, you know, what, what makes IR awesome? I think what makes IR awesome is really we have this attitude of we can do it, right? Um, I think Interventional radiologists are often the last line of defense. And what I mean by this is there's so often on an everyday basis, it's like, well, this patient is too sick for us to take to to the OR. Or, hey, you know, we couldn't get that central line in. Can you help us out? Or, you know, this patient um, basically is going to die. What can you do? Like that's, these are everyday conversations. And as interventional radiologists, we're often the last line of defense in the hospital. And it's like, well, yeah, let's try something. We can do it. And, And the reason that we can often do something is that, Interventional radiologists definitely think outside the box and I think are the ultimate problem solvers. And that's kind of, you know, I talked about it as an engineer for thinking through, hey, you know, what um, what at the end of the day is sort of applied science and what what problems can I solve in front of me? Like interventional radiologists are really a lot of in, a good interventional radiologist can think through these problems and think outside the box and really come up with incredibly unique solutions to different issues. You know, I mean, we have a procedural skill set that's really unmatched by any specialty. So there are other specialties that will do some of the stuff we do and have endovascular skills, for example, cardiology, uh, neurosurgery, vascular surgery, all do things that are endovascular related, right? Catheter and wire skills. Um, but the skill set of the interventional radiologist is that plus so much else from a procedural standpoint. Now, I can't crack open a chest and you know tie a thoracic aortic graft like a vascular surgeon can, of course, but I can think about ways to treat this through maybe an ultrasound procedure combined with a CT and being able to get to the smallest arteries in the body with a catheter and essentially put a coil there or something along those lines, right? Um, So the procedural skill set that we have as interventional radiologists, I think is really unmatched um, by any other specialty. And then I think what's so cool about IR is literally, I take care of patients across the spectrum. And that that really means like pediatric patients. That means patients who are dying on the table. Like literally this patient is going to die on the table pretty much every month, unfortunately, we have a patient who dies on the table because they were so sick and they needed an IR procedure and, and they, they, they unfortunately didn't make it. At the same time, I treat patients who, are, who say, you know what, the vein in my leg is bothering me when I wear a swimsuit. Can you help me with that? So we do like cosmetic procedures, right? So this, this like entire spectrum of, of procedures that an interventional radiologist can do and the types of patients we take care of is just so varied. And that, that's one thing that's really cool to me about it. You know, it's, um, 
there are other specialties that are very focused, right? Um, and, and that's awesome because they're super focused on, on just that and that problem over and over again. In IR, we're focused on problems of the vascular system. We're focused on problems of the brain. We're focused on problems of the GI system. We're focused, like, it's just all over the spectrum of what we can do. Again, from the sickest patient who's dying on the table to literally that patient who says, again, like these, these varicose veins in my legs are kind of unsightly. You know, those like spider veins that you get, the veins yeah. in your legs that kind of look funky and you wear a swimsuit and you don't like them, like we treat those, right? That like, that's some of the stuff that we also treat. So it's like this wide spectrum of things that we treat that I think makes it, um, makes it super exciting. Um, and so, you know, what I wanted to do was take you guys through just a couple of cases, right? Um, to, to think through like what this looks like. Um, I'm going to create some new pathways. I'm going to fix an aneurysm. I'm going to stent a venous obstruction. I'm going to open up veins that have been clotted for years and uh, restore intractable pain, right? So I'm just, these are five different cases that I thought um, just capture, you know, sort of an everyday life in interventional radiologist. And I can go on, you know, I could have 50 cases that are interesting like this. This is just a small, small version, but um, you know, here, here's the first case and, um, you know, maybe Sam and Dan, I'll, I'll rely on you guys a little bit to think through, you know, what you guys are thinking, Dan, you, you being a fourth year med student, I mean, 46 year old man comes up coughing up blood. Like what, what are you thinking? So I'm thinking, why would he be coughing up blood? There are several different reasons for this to be happening. Um, is he, did he tear a part of his esophagus? Does he have like a superficial or even a deep tear? Does he have some sort of varices? Like maybe he's a chronic alcohol user who has varices now in the esophagus and, and might be coughing up blood from one of those ruptured varices. Um, could be a lot of different things like that. Maybe he has a gastric ulcer even. So there's a lot of different things that could be causing this. Yeah, so so that's ex exactly right, right? So there's a lot of different things that have been causing somebody to cough up blood. Um, and we, what you guys just saw Dan do was sort of go through some of what's called a differential diagnosis. And, and he's gonna ask that patient some more specific questions, right? Like. Hey, how many, how much do you drink on a daily basis? The patient says, I never drink. Well, it's probably going to put you down one category. On the other hand, if the patient says, I drink a pint of vodka a day, it's going to put you down another category. Um, and so the, you know, as a, as a physician, as a med student, you know, these are some of the things where you, you see coughing up blood, it can actually be caused by a huge amount of different things. Right. And the, the goal of a clinician is to actually nail down what's, what that, what's causing that. And so I, as an interventional radiologist, may actually not be involved in the nailing down of that. Actually, that's more of a, that's more of maybe the emergency medicine doc or the internal medicine doc um, who's taking the initial history of things. Um, but they may call me later when they say, okay, you know what, this is due to varices. And so just want to take you guys through um, why this may happen, right? And so let's say that the, this guy said, you know what, I'm drinking 10 pints a day, 10 beers a day for the last 30 years, right? You're kind of really thinking that this guy has liver problems at the end of the day. And liver problems and coughing up blood very much means that this person has varices, most likely, right? So so what are varices? Sam, have you ever heard of varices? No, never. All right. So so let me let me kind of take you through what what this looks like, right? So the, the body has this incredible way of um, adapting to different situations. And varices is an adaptation to a bad situation, right? So this is your liver, right? And you, the, the whole point of your liver is to filter out blood, right? So anything you eat um, basically goes through what's called your mesenteric system. And, and the nutrients and everything else, nutrients and good stuff and bad stuff basically essentially come back through the mesenteric system, right? Um, this is kind of an oversimplification, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Basically, your the blood when you eat something needs to be filtered before it goes back to the rest of your body, right? So, uh, if you've eaten toxins, if you've eaten something that the the body doesn't like, like the liver is your filter at the end of the day for those things, okay? And so, what happens in a normal situation is your blood, the nutrients that the blood needs, will come back these little red dots are blood. It's going to come back. It's going to be filtered by the liver. And then it's going to go up the hepatic veins. And actually your heart would sit up here and it goes into your heart and then your heart pumps and then it gets it to the rest of the body, right? Um, actually goes to the lungs and then gets to the rest of the body. So those are, that's basically what happens to, um, that's what your liver does. It filters out toxins at the end of the day, right? And simplification is your liver filters out toxins. What happens when you drink a lot is that your liver 
ends up being crappy, right? It ends up sort of not working the way it should. And so instead of filtering out, it basically becomes hard. And as it becomes really hard, what happens is that blood can no longer flow through the liver in the way that it's supposed to. And so instead, what happens is that blood goes up and it actually, like the liver kicks it back out. It's like too high resistance for it to go hmm. um, through the liver. And so what it does, it actually goes through veins that are really not supposed to be there um, or were there when you were a baby. There's this whole other um, uh, talk probably on OBGYN about this incredible, uh, what's incredible, about, like the fetal circulation. It's really cool. Basically, the fetal circulation is sort of almost reversed compared to the compared to the um, adult or even pediatric circulation. So when you have a placenta, things go opposite directions. And I'm not an OB, and I'm not going to talk about that because I don't remember any of that. But basically, there are all these different pathways that open up, and one of them is like the coronary vein, and this is the stomach. These are what's called short gastric veins, or short, um, and basically they will um, they will kind of go around the stomach or the esophagus. And so in a normal situation, you don't have those, you don't have all these veins and they're not very big, but in an abnormal situation, when your liver can't filter out the blood, essentially these get really big. Okay. And so what happens is that these get really big. They sort of hop around and go around the esophagus and stomach. And these are what ends up bleeding, right? And that's what's called a varix. A varix is basically an abnormal vein, something that is dilated to a, a, a area where it shouldn't be and can easily cause bleeding, right? The blood's got to come back somehow, right? And it comes back through these different pathways. And so there's a lot of things that people can offer this patient, right? So the medicine ED team, they can fluid resuscitate the patient, right? Let's say that they're, they're dying on the table, their blood pressure is low. Maybe they placed that central line we talked about, right? And they gave them a bunch of blood real quick to get, to get their blood, uh, blood pressure back up. Um, they can start drugs to pressure support and constrict the system to make sure that the, essentially the brain gets enough blood um, so that the person doesn't die of brain damage uh, in the meantime. Um, our GI colleagues can do a lot of stuff with these varices, right? They can actually go in through the mouth and they can band a varic. So they can see a bleeding varic and they can band it. They can place what's called a Blakemore tube, which is essentially like a really big balloon to stop the bleeding uh, at, that, at that juncture. And then there's also some surgical options, but the surgical options aren't really very good in the short term, right? So if this person's like coughing up blood, you can't go get them a new liver and place it into their body right away. Liver transplants take... Uh, years to get, you know? Um, so this patient uh, may end up being referred to IR. And, and what, what, I, what I think is really cool is what, what I'm going to do for this patient is I'm going to create a new pathway, right? So here's how I'll talk to patient. I'm going to save your life by having your blood bypass these bleeding veins, by creating a new pathway for the blood to flow through, by blindly sticking a really long needle from one side of your body to the other, and then putting a stent through the liver. And at the end, I'll put a bandaid on your neck. Like that is what I'm going to do for this patient. And I, I say this because I think that this is like <laughs> the coolest thing in the world, right? So this is what's called a TIPS procedure. And, and actually, this is one of the ways I initially got interested in IR. I remember hearing about this in med school and I was blown away. I was like, wait, 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 what, what just happened there? We were able to save this patient's life who was bleeding from a varix and create this whole new pathway through the body. Uh, and then put a bandaid on their neck at the end and they, they walk away like that was that blew me away. And so this is what's called a tips procedure. And essentially, you know, this is the liver again. What we do is we come down through the neck and I find the hepatic vein, which is the vein that essentially drains the liver. And I essentially get into here and then I stick with this really long needle from the neck. And I try to find the portal vein, which is that vein that brings the, the blood back from the bowel. And once I'm able to stick there, I'm able to place a stent through essentially at the end of it. Um, and that stent now, instead of blood coming here and then getting to the liver and then flowing back, like we saw in the bad liver, what it's able to do is able to go through here and then go through the stent because that stent is just open and a path of least resistance. And so blood can kind of flow back the normal way it's supposed to flow. How do you um, find those veins? How do you know yeah, so, where you're at? That sounds difficult. 
Yeah. So, I mean, basically what we do is while we're doing this, we understand where the hepatic vein is. We, based on anatomy and based on doing this a lot, you know exactly where these things are supposed to be. You inject some contrast essentially as you go to be able to find your way. But I can tell you, you know, right from an x-ray where I'm at. I, so I look at the x-ray and I look at where my catheter is and I know exactly based on anatomy where that hepatic vein is supposed to come off. And I know it's okay. It's right there. Now for the portal vein, oftentimes I just we are sticking blindly in some ways, but we know, again, based on anatomy, maybe based on the CT scan beforehand, well, it's in front of where my catheter currently is. And so I'm going to angle this needle essentially forward. And as I angle this needle forward, it should hit that. It should hit that. Like, that's kind of how we do it. We kind of know the anatomical relations of things and are able to find our way based on that. That's awesome. Yeah. Incredible. So this is, kind of, this is kind of what it looks like. So, you know, I, I, uh, if you were sitting there next to me, like this is what I'm looking at, right? I'm, I'm like literally staring at the screen and this is kind of what it looks like. So I, I come down, this is the heart right here. This is the liver. And I, again, I, we just kind of know that from looking at x-rays and understanding. And I know that this is the hepatic vein. And so this is after that tip stent has been placed. You actually see, I mean, you, you see, you see that like a little ring and all these stents, that's, that's the tip stent. That's the stent that we've placed. And what you see is that as we inject here, these are the varices. Remember I said that blood should normally flow this way and then up this way. But what you're seeing is that blood is actually flowing this way and then up this way because that liver is really hard. And so this right here is kind of where the stomach lies. And you can imagine if you have this giant vein wrapping around the stomach or around the esophagus, that's what causes it to bleed. And so in this case, we place the tip stent, which shoves, shoves the blood the way it should. And then we actually ended up coiling this thing and embolizing it. So embolizing means shutting down the blood flow. And we basically pack this thing with a bunch of metal coils and plugs. And then as we inject, okay, now we see blood is no longer flowing all the way up here it's flowing back this way in the way that it, it should. And so this patient is no longer going to bleed from that area. In fact, they're gonna, the blood's going to flow back the way that it, it normally should. Um, so that's, that's a TIPS procedure. It's called a, it's called a TIPS. And it, it, again, it's like one of the coolest things, I think, um, that we do. And again, I was blown away about this in med school. And now I you know, do this twice a week. You know, it's one of these things where I was like, wow, this is super cool. Um, and these are the things that we kind of do every day as IRs. Um, so I, I don't know, I, questions? What do you guys think uh, on, on that one? Quick question. That's crazy. About, yeah. So quick question about that then. So you said the liver is doing a lot of the filtration, like metabolizing the whatever is going through the mesenteric system. Now, when you put in this, this tips, like when you do this procedure, now the blood is just bypassing the liver. So like what's happening to the blood? Well, that's a great question, right? So the blood is bypassing the liver. So not as much blood is going to the liver to get filtered, right? Because we put this tube in that essentially takes the blood from the mesenteric system directly to the systemic circulation and we bypass the liver. So it, we can answer this question in a couple of ways. Number one, you're not normal because you've sort of unfortunately taken the normal filtration away. But in a liver patient, you were never normal, which is to say that that blood already wasn't flowing that way. Right. And so we, we look out for things and want to make sure that things get still get metabolized. Um, but some of the stuff that can't get metabolized, some, some toxins like ammonia, for instance, um, can build up in a liver patient. And ammonia, for instance, can actually build up and cause confusion or what's called hepatic encephalopathy. So these are things that we actually look out for post-procedure. So basically, in a liver patient, you are still bypassing the liver. Some of the blood is still getting filtered through, but you're definitely taking blood and sort of putting it directly back into the systemic circulation. But most of these patients already had blood going directly back into the systemic circulation. Right. It was just going through a varix, which has a high propensity to bleed. And so we're kind of trading one system for another system, of one that we can control a little bit more and we know won't bleed because this will bleed. This won't bleed at the end of the day. Right. Okay. Um, so, you know, here, here's another, you know, case. Um, so 76 year old male came in with hypotension, right? Hypotension means your blood pressure is low. 
right? And so when your blood pressure is low, you got to be thinking about a, a number of things. I mean, Sam, as a pre-med, you probably have taken, you know, people's blood pressure. When you see a low blood mm -hmm. pressure, I mean, are you worried about anything? Uh, maybe they're losing blood volume somehow. Yeah, that's perfect, right? So one of the things you got to be worried about is that they're losing their blood volume, right? They're bleeding, they're bleeding maybe, yeah. yeah. Exactly, they're bleeding somewhere. And so um, obviously there's a lot of reasons for hypotension, but one of them could be bleeding. And in this case, um, what you're actually seeing is a bleeding blood vessel. So this is, this is what's called a CT scan, right? A CT scan is a way to peer inside the body. And a, a diagnostic radiologist really reads these CT scans and is able to understand them. As interventional radiologists, we are, we are trained in diagnostic radiology, so we can read them and understand them too. Emergency medicine people can, surgery surgeons can, like a lot of people are going to be able to read a CT scan and kind of get a gist of what's going on. And what you see here is, this is the aorta, right? This is like the big vessel that's taking blood from uh, your your heart to the to your legs, um, and then you see this giant thing here. That's totally abnormal. That shouldn't be there in any way whatsoever. Um, you can see it also on a coronal plane. So this is sort of cutting. This first picture is cutting you this way and taking a look. This next picture is cutting you this way and taking a look. And so what you're seeing here is this giant aneurysm um, that is losing blood, right? So this person is losing blood from this aneurysm. Aneurysms can happen all over the place, in the arteries, uh, it can happen in the veins, but it can happen in the aorta, it can happen in a thoracic aorta, like up here, it can happen in the abdominal aorta, or it can happen in these small vessels. In this case, the aneurysm is actually off of what's called the um, common hepatic artery. And so this is us, right? So this is, again, this is what I'm seeing. As I'm doing this, what I've done is I've gone in through the groin, okay? I've put that tiny little needle into the groin with that little IV, and I've inserted this long catheter, and I found my way up to the what's called the celiac artery. And then I've injected the celiac artery, and I see normal artery, normal artery, okay, that is very abnormal. Arteries should get smaller as they go, right? So if you, if you kind of don't look at this for a sec. Look at this, right? So this is a normal artery and it's like a tree, right? The branches of a tree get smaller as you go. So it gets smaller and smaller, right? Smaller and smaller. And the ones in the middle are bigger and the ones out in the periphery are smaller. This is clearly not supposed to be there. That entire thing is not supposed to be there. This is a giant aneurysm that's bleeding and is rupturing and causing the guy to continue to bleed and die and lose, lose volume, right? And so how do we solve this problem? Well, what's, again, so cool about IR is we can actually solve this problem by, I, what I've done is I've put a sheath up here, and I'm about to put a stent right over that area, right? And so as I put that stent over the area, what's going to happen is that it's going to, oh, the blood is just going to go through there. It's a covered stent. So I've deployed a stent across that entire area, and now I inject again, and you don't see the aneurysm, right? because I've totally excluded it. I've totally taken it away um, because the blood can no longer fill that aneurysm, which is essentially a hole in the artery, right? So here we had a giant hole in the artery and then I essentially plugged the hole, right? I did some plumbing, right? I patched the hole with, with, a, with the stent and that's it. This is, the, this is what's called a CT scan after, and you can see that that big aneurysm is gone. You can see this flow maintained all the way to the, to the liver, right? So you couldn't just, go in and operate on this. If you went and operate this, this patient would die, right? So if you tried to cut this patient open, like what are you gonna do with this thing? It's gonna burst open, it's gonna bleed everywhere. This is the only option this patient had was to be able to somehow embolize, stent, graft, or whatever else, shut that down through an interventional approach. What's the cause of that? So this can be caused by a lot of different things. Uh, in this case, there's a couple of clues. Dan, any, any idea what, what may have caused this? Um, I mean, I was thinking something along the lines of just like old age where there's maybe weakness in the arterial walls, but I mean, I don't, I don't know. That's actually really interesting because I've never seen that before. So, so there are a bunch of causes of aneurysms, right? So one of them is certainly old age. One of them is just vascular abnormality. So young people can have aneurysms, right? One of them is prior surgeries or other interventions can sometimes weaken the arteries or cause it smoking um, calcium, you know, all these things could cause different aneurysms, different places. In this case, one of the clues that you have is that, what do you, what do you see here? You see this? Uh, yeah. Staples or something? Exactly. Those are staples. So this patient actually had a prior surgery. 
this patient actually had a very recent surgery um, and they, they, they were cut open. Um, it looks like they also have an ERCP stent in. Dan, that might be interesting to you. They have an ERCP yep. stent in, right? And so this patient had a, had a surgery in the area of the liver previous to this. And that's what caused this, um, this artery to open up. So there was some manipulation during surgery that unfortunately caused the artery to, to have an issue. Wow. Cool. Got it. So, um, you know, here, here's just sort of um, some of the ways we treat aneurysms, right? So this is basically the way I treated that aneurysm, right? I basically put this stent graft in, but we can do other things too. Like we can coil the aneurysm. We can pack a bunch of coils in there to thrombose the thing off, or we can maybe even coil basically the inflow and the outflow to an aneurysm. So there's blood that goes in, there's blood that comes out. What if I just shut down that entire artery and say, no more blood here. Like, let's just stop blood going here you want to do different things in different cases, right? So in this particular case, I couldn't do that because the, the rest of the blood was actually supplying the liver. And so you can't just stop the blood that's supplying the liver, that would cause issues. So I needed to keep the rest of the blood a, a open. And in which case a stent graft is a really nice option, keeps the rest of the blood sort of flowing. Um, all right, so here's another case. I'll go through the last ones a little bit quicker, just just so you guys sort of get it, get get a feel. So, you know, this is a guy who's coming in with facial facial swelling and shortness of breath, right? Um, and a couple of things, you know, for pre meds to notice. Um, he's got a tube down his throat, right? This is this is a endotracheal tube, so he's being ventilated at this point, right? So he is basically being ventilated, supportive of oxygen and supportive respiratory systems, right? So he's hooked up to a big ventilator, which is pumping air into his body. Um, you can see that his face looks pretty swollen, right? His eyes look pretty swollen. Um, he basically, you know, his, his neck looks big and he's coming in with the shortness of breath and facial swelling um, and had to be intubated because he just essentially couldn't breathe. And this is sort of classic for something that's called SVC syndrome or superior vena cava syndrome, right? And so you look at this picture, I mean, you know, this is obviously a graphic, but that's kind of exactly what he looks like, right? Like his face is all swollen. Um, and the reason for this is oftentimes that there could be a lung tumor or something along those lines blocking the blood flow from the face back to the heart, right? So blood's got to come back somehow, right? Blood's got to come back from the brain, back to the heart to be pumped to the rest of the body. Blood's got to come back from the arms to the brain, to the, to the lungs to be pumped to the rest of the body, right? If you had something that's blocking that blood vessel, basically blood backs up. And so in this case, what happens is that there's a tumor blocking, which often can happen, the main blood vessel called the superior vena cava that takes all the blood from the head and brings it back to the rest of the, brings it back to the heart. And when it blocks, basically that blood backs up. And so what you see is this guy's face getting swollen because blood is essentially backing up, right? It has nowhere to go. At the end of the day, it's all plumbing, right? So, so it's all just basic plumbing. Blood has nowhere to go. It backs up to his face. And that causes his throat to swell. That causes his eyes to get puffy. That causes his uh, uh, head to get big. That's superior vena cava syndrome. And so this is kind of what a CT scan looks like that, of that. You can see this is, these are sort of normal lungs. And then you see this gray area here, right? Like that's, that's abnormal lung, uh, basically because he has, a, he has a big tumor here. Um, and this is a, the same CT scan, just um, essentially filtered, right? So this is kind of like an Instagram filter, but an opposite, right? So this is, this is a way for us to see, you can see here, I can see the lungs real well. Here, I don't see the lungs at all, but I see the blood vessels real well. And I can see that there's a clear narrowing of the superior vena cava, right? So this is the blood vessel that should be coming down here. And there's a clear narrowing because of all of this soft tissue there. And so what I would do as an amateur radiologist, I do a venogram, right? And so I come in, and in this case, I actually come in from the groin, and I do this injection. So forget the right side for a second. Look at the left side, right? When I do this injection, what you see is you see all these blood vessels that shouldn't be there, right? They're going up to the, to the, um, to the face, essentially. And so essentially what you're having is a backup of blood through the system, right? They're going back up the system. So instead of blood going from here down here, it's actually going from here up here, right? And so that's what's causing the backup. And so what I did here was place a stent. The minute I place a stent and inject that contrast again, you see all of these things are gone, right? Now blood flows directly down into the heart the way it should. 
And so this is uh, an SVC stenting, a very common condition that we deal with and something that we stent all the time, uh, depending on the pathology of this. So what's really cool about this is that oftentimes immediately you see a big result, right? And so this is that same patient 10 minutes after the stenting, and you can see already, look how much better his face is, right? Look how much better his eyes are, that all that swelling is gone instantly because the blood now has a way and a pathway to go forward back into the heart. So, so that, you know, it's a very simple, uh, relatively simple and quick procedure that we can do, but it, um, it can really make a tremendous impact and obviously, you know, really save a patient from, from being essentially dead because he can't breathe. This guy can't breathe at the end of the day with this. Make sense? Yep. Um, you know, this is another, this is a similar case, but in one which we treat like quite differently. So you, you can see this is a right hand and a left hand, right? And you can see that right hand is huge, right? Compared to the left. So he's got arm swelling. And the reason he has arm swelling is because he's a dialysis patient and has had different, um, basically a graft created up here. So dialysis patients need their blood filtered through a dialysis machine, right? And for that to happen, they need blood to be taken in and out of the in and out of their system and oftentimes what you create what's called a fistula the surgeons will create a fistula in order to do that now what happens over time is unfortunately these fistulas sort of close down and this is one of the big problems with diabetic patients who end up on uh, dialysis and what's called end stage renal disease they basically have all they have issues with their venous access and their flow um, and they can't get dialysis in the way that they want what happened in this case is similar to the last case, but instead of the tumor sort of growing over the course of maybe weeks to months, this is something that actually happens over the course of years. And so you see when we inject contrast, what you're seeing here is this is the chest, right? Can you see the, can you make out the ribs here? These are ribs, right? And so these are ribs. This is the heart, okay? And then this is the arm. So this guy's arm is out this way. And what we're looking at is essentially this area right here. And so when you inject contrast, what you see is that normally the contrast should come this way, right? It should cut all the, all the blood should flow from the arm back to the heart, right? It should flow back this way. But in his case, it doesn't. It actually ends up flowing the opposite way, right? So it flows through these tiny little collateral veins, is what we call them, all the way back to the heart. But that causes his arm to swell, right? Because he's got all these veins, essentially. Again, it's a plumbing problem. The blood can't get from one side to the other. And so you can see that's where the, that's where essentially where the blood stops. Um, and this is a, this is the same x-ray sort of with the bones where you can see a little better so you can understand where you are, right? This is the shoulder, right? Right here. And so this is everything that's backing up and you can see why his arm is sort of swelling because of all these different things. And so what can I do as an IR, right? So what I did was I basically created an, a new pathway, right? So I essentially came from the groin and I came from the arm and I said, how am I going to connect these two dots? Right? Cause that's what I got to do, right? That, at some point, this guy had these dots connected, right? The, the normal essentially brachycephalic and superior vena cava should come this way, but they've scarred down over time to nothing, which can happen. Basically these veins can scar down. And so what I did was I took this point and I took this point. And again, with my really long needle, I basically connected the two. And so I took a super long needle from the groin. I basically connected it to this point up here and I grabbed it and I said, okay, now I have a connection. And once I have that connection, well, I can do anything I want. So this is actually the needle. It's like this very thin, long needle, right? So it's 65 centimeters. So it's pretty long, very thin. And essentially I stuck it from the groin all the way to here. And then once I have that, well, now I can place a stent there. Right. So once I place that stent, all the blood flow comes back. So instead of all those things that you saw, the blood flow comes back the way it's supposed to. Right. Um, so that's like creating it's a, similar to the tips procedure in some ways, but it's in a completely different part of the body. It's completely different indication. It's but when I said that IRs basically have this like procedural skill set, this is sort of what I'm talking about. Like we can do all these different things in different parts of the body. This might be a dumb question, but I'm just like, when you're running a wire through veins, are you ever f f scared you're going to puncture the vein? I mean, how well do those hold up when you're moving things through them? Uh, it's a great question. So definitely. So we're always scared that we're going to come out of the vein or come out of the, 
come out of the artery. Sometimes we want to do that on purpose, right? In this case, mm -hmm. I definitely wanted to come out of the vein on purpose because there was no more vein left. So I needed to come out. Um, right. But I have to do it in a way that makes sense that I want that I um, can control and make sure I have a backup option, right? So you can perforate out of an artery and you can run into situations where it's an issue, right? So you perforate out of an artery and now you've caused bleeding in that, in that area. What you have to do is have backup options, right? Maybe I stent it, maybe I balloon it, maybe I understand that it's happening right then and there and I can treat it because I'm, I'm right there. But that definitely can happen. Okay. And so this is that sort of normal connection. Um, and then one last case, right? So, um, you know, I said that we treat all kinds of different conditions and I've talked a lot about endovascular stuff, but here's something that's totally not endovascular, right? This is something that is outside. Uh, this is actually in the realm of bones and orthopedic surgery, but we do this too, right? So this, this is a, uh, female who fell and she had back pain and basically she required narcotics and she was found to have a spinal compression fracture which is basically a compression of the of the spine right and so i said that you know one of the uh, specialties i was considering when i was a med student was ortho and it's kind of cool because i kind of get to do some ortho now too um basically you know we can treat we can treat this so when the bone in the in the spinal column fractures we can actually go in there through x-ray guidance, put up a balloon, and then fill it with cement. This is a procedure called a kyphoplasty, right? Um, so this is what it looks like. This is what's called an MRI. An MRI is like a CT scan, but actually a little bit different. It sort of uses different physics and um, is able to give you a lot of soft tissue detail. And what you see here is this is the spinal cord, right? So you see all that white, that's the spinal cord. You see these, you see these like little um, square shaped things. Those are the vertebral bodies, right? So that's, that's, those are each vertebral bodies. And what you'll notice is that this one vertebral body kind of looks a little bit squished and is bright, right? And so it's got what's called water in it. It's got edema in it. And that tells us that, hey, this, this thing is fractured. So this is a fractured vertebral body and this is what's causing her pain, right? When you ask her where her pain is, she says it's right here. She points just to that, that, that place. And this can be really painful for, for patients, right? You can imagine their spinal column is cracked. It's painful. So what I can do as an IR is essentially go in and find the, that vertebral body, right? So I look on x-ray, I find the right place, and I put a needle into that area. Through that needle, I essentially make it bigger and bigger and bigger until I can get a balloon in that area. I inflate the balloon to give myself a little bit of height, and then I fill the thing with cement to harden it up. So it's kind of like, you know, if you, broke a, if you broke your wrist, you might get a metal plate there, right, in order to fixate it. That's essentially what we're doing for this patient. Um, and it's great because patients, like this patient, was in horrendous pain, couldn't get up, and she sees me back in clinic two days later, and this is what she looks like. She wow. says, look at me, I'm able to get up, I'm feeling great. Like, so these are the things that... Um, you know, are, are so satisfying, right? We came back and we talked about like at the end of the day, helping somebody and sort of making that impact. Um, and I really feel like, you know, we obviously do that as physicians, as IRs uh, for sure. So, you know, I, I went through a bunch of cases there, um, but but the idea was to give you a little bit of flavor of, of maybe, you know, what an interventional radiologist does and, and how we do it on a daily basis. Nice. That's very impressive, honestly. Like it's really yeah, it's cool awesome. kind of things IRs can do. Especially yeah. that last one. I mean, that you're going from one day where you can't really walk or, you know, you're in so much pain to, to being, being able to, to do a lot more. That's, that's very amazing. Yeah, you could definitely make an immediate impact. And I think that's, you know, as you're thinking through shadowing different specialties and looking at it, like there are some specialties that have very long-term impact and that's fantastic, right? Um, internal medicine, family medicine docs, like these guys have long-term relationships with patients. They see them over time, psychiatry, right? And you see sort of progress in uh, disease management that way. And then there are other specialties that are very much in the moment, right? And I feel like IR is an well, in the moment specialty for the most part, where you see a patient, they have some issue, you treat them, you see them in follow-up, and then they're, they're sort of discharged from your care. There are other specialties like that too, right? Like orthopedic surgery, maybe, right? Somebody comes in with a, a broken wrist, you treat them for that, and then they're, you, know, you sort of see them just for that problem, and then they're gone from your care. Um, so that, I mean, that's a decision point for, for students to make, right? For, for med students. Um, 
in particular, like, which one do I like? Do I like that longitudinal care, which has so many benefits? Or do I like the short-term care, which also has so many benefits and different people might like different things? Right. Very good. Well, Dr. Maida, I, I want to say thank you again for joining us. Uh, I think it was really interesting. And I hope that pre-meds really find it as interesting as I did. Thank you so much, Dr. Maida. No problem. Thank you, guys. If any of you guys have questions or anything I can answer, you know, feel free to uh, drop me a message through whatever means Med School Coach has. Happy to sort of uh, talk through. Thank you for listening to the Virtual Shadowing Podcast, powered by Med School Coach. Watch each physician present their cases, along with fascinating images and visuals, at shadowing.medschoolcoach.com. There, you will also find a quiz that accompanies each specialty.